Okay, I'm Stephen Cox. Uh, I'm a sculptor, an English, and I'm generally known for working in stone. And in particular, I'm very, very interested in working with the hardest stones in the world, uh, in particular imperial porphyry. My interest uh, in working in stones in a more in a specific way or historical way uh, was to do with the fact that when I moved from England to Italy to begin work on an exhibition at the Palazzo Reale, my work was out of a kind of conceptual minimal background and uh, I was working with ideas of developing from a tabula rasa from big plaster reliefs made with building materials in the building process. These things were not architecture, they weren't sculpture and they weren't painting. Or they were all of those things, mm. but precisely their, the activity of making these things was uh, as a temporary um, uh, installation. Uh, this was back in the late 70s. Um, using uh, building plaster and, as I say, um, just common or garden building techniques. So there was the sort of demystification of the processes right. of, of, of art. Um, but one of the things that developed from the very first pieces I made, which were to do with relief, if you like, the minute a line is either uh, engraved into a surface or a line is seen to evolve from the addition of material, then the space of otherwise blankness becomes ambiguous in terms of spatiality. Mm. So I was working on these panels that were leaning against walls and the reference on the surface by using illusionistic techniques through using Alberti's principles of single point perspective, the images on the surface of these either carved stones or leaning slabs uh, was an image of the space within which the panel was leaning. Okay, yeah. So I was involved in a pictorialism, which really opened up a whole idea of working from an idea of an artist being someone involved in the dialogue with contemporary issues. So, using Vasari's on technique, I travelled around Italy visiting the quarries uh, of the stones that he listed as being of, in of interest to... Uh, the artists of the Renaissance. So I went to, at the beginning I was in Milan, I went to uh, places that were of particular interest to Adrian Stokes, so I went to the quarries of Red Verona marble mm. uh, and subtypes like Bronzetto di Valpolicella, which is a beautiful kind of champagne colored uh, um, stone from the Verona region. Um, and I suppose that was my main sort of interest in the land. And then I went south to Florence and I went to visit the quarries um, that produced the uh, beautiful blue sandstone uh, of Pietro Serena, mm. Pietro Forte, and uh, associated materials in that, in that area. And then when I went south to Rome, where I was lent a house, um, near Bracciano, Lago di Bracciano, a place called Anguillara, which was close to the um, Peperino quarries, which was the building material of Rome before Travertine was right. introduced. So it was a kind of very, very profound significance to the Etruscan civilization. And the interest in the historical as well as the materiality of these, uh, these stones listed by Vasari, and worked in these places and created exhibitions using these stones. Mm. Interestingly, the one stone that um, was not listed, uh, was not available in Italy, but listed by, by Vasari, was the very, very hard, deep red and liverish stone called Imperial Porphyry. They knew, I think, that it came from Egypt, but nevertheless, no one had a source for it. But its interest, which Alberti became profoundly kind of obsessed by, was how with the uh, metallurgy of uh, the Renaissance, it was impossible to carve this material. Mm. How did the Romans deal with it? Which they did with extraordinary uh, um, you know, in, create imagination. Um, 
uh, there was obviously a fantastic uh, will to master this hardest of stones. Yeah, yeah. So these are, thing, are things that became of particular interest to me. And I'd been working in Italy. I had a studio at, America, at the American Academy. Uh, and I worked on this exhibition using, at that time, Peperino stone and uh, exhibited in Rome at a gallery called uh, La Salita, which was quite a well-known um, a well-known radical gallery, which coincidentally was the place where Richard Serra had his first exhibition when he was a student at the American Academy. So as time went by, I did some interesting exhibitions, I hope, uh, in various places, working in Florence, working on ideas with fragmentation, uh, the idea of archaeology being, if you like, as creative for the present as it's to do with trying to give an indication of what came down to us from mm, the past. Yeah. So the scientific uh, analysis, the sort of forensic look at fragments, marks on stone, what they mean, was some somehow uh, very uh, reassuring that whatever happens in the past, whatever comes to cause, let's say, a, an extraordinary change in the powers that be in directing how civilization is going to go, often requires some kind of iconoclasm. Mm. But the, in, the extraordinary, uh, let's say, forensic kind of analysis of uh, things of the past enable us to rebuild a picture of the past and see how the passage of time is changed by all sorts of forces. So I left to go back to England, and out of the blue, a couple of years after I'd returned, um, I was asked by uh, the Foreign Office, uh, the British um, kind of Foreign Policy Department, who we've always had an idea, I think, in England for the soft power of art, and so the British councils had a very, very profound uh, interest in politics in a subtle way. Um, and I was asked if I would be prepared to make a sculpture for the Opera House in Cairo as a gift to the Egyptian people from mm. the British. So uh, this rang a bell, and I was very, very excited about the possibility of being able to negotiate uh, access to the imperial porphyry quarries of the eastern mountains of Egypt, which I knew a bit about. I'd done some research. And so this sequence of events enabled me to go meet some people. It was amazing that amongst the people I met was the Minister of Culture in Egypt who had happened to have been a friend of, uh, of, Jan, um, of uh, excuse me, Shane, so I'll do a cut on that. <laughs> um, in meeting the, uh, the Minister of Culture in Cairo, um, I met a man who had been a very good friend while he was director of the Egyptian Academy in Rome of, um, of Giovanni Carandente, who had been a great friend of uh, many American artists and uh, was very, very significant in the uh, selection, the invitation to David Smith, one of my heroes, uh, to repre represent contemporary art 25 years before in the Spoleto Festival. Mm. So, uh, I, whilst I was in Egypt, uh, in Egypt, I was able to speak a bit of Italian uh, and communicate with the Egyptian ambassador, who was very, very helpful to me. And through the Minerals um, Geological Mining and Mapping Authority of, of Egypt, I was given access to the quarries in negotiations with the military, because this area was a militarized zone mm. when I first went there. So access to the Imperial Porphyry Quarry was given to me. And since then, I've tried to maintain access to the material through various, uh, uh, various people who collect stones in the desert and sell them through various sources in Egypt. And so here we have uh, in my studio in Shropshire, about 20 tons of uh, porphyry, uh, about 15 tons of which came back just a couple of years ago to go with the material that I brought back after I had finished my project for the Opera House in Cairo. I'm pleased to say that the sculpture that was made for it, uh, there's a pair of sculptures, are still standing. 
and um, one of the pieces that I brought back which wasn't selected for that particular job is in the collection of the Tate Gallery and another piece, uh, a very large piece, is here with us here which we can see later. Now you've seen Stephen Cox discuss Peregrine Sentinel, and I wanted to bring in a few more views of that sculpture that I didn't capture in the video that I made when I was there in his house. Um, so here we're looking at uh, the front and sides of Peregrine uh, Sentinel, and you can see the wonderful variety of textures. One of the things that Stephen emphasizes in his work is uh, the relationship that he has with the material and has a great deal of respect, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, for what it took to form this imperial porphyry, for how rare it is, for how difficult it is to work, and for the weight of history and symbolism that it has. Uh, and so a lot of that is reflected here. Um, you might notice the, the wonderful sort of abstracted bird shape, but you might also notice that uh, the form here also resembles that of a female figure. Um, a lot of his work tends to explore really sort of classic abstract forms that could be read in a multitude of ways. Um, and the other thing I want you to notice is uh, the, the attention being played to different textures um, and to sort of responding to the different faces of the stone. So here we see uh, those views and here uh, we have a slightly better detail. Here we're looking at uh, the side of the sculpture and a detail of the front and top. You can see the unfinished texture that we have at the top of the sculpture and also down at the very foot of the sculpture. And then the entire back has been left in that sort of unfinished, broken state that you would have uh, for stone coming directly from the quarry. I love this particular detail of the, the stone uh, in Peregrine Sentinel. Um, here, this is at the base of the sculpture, and you can see this very rough, unfinished piece of the sculpture, and it shows all of those working marks, and you can get a sense from this of just how difficult it is to work these, these hard stones like porphyry, basalt, and diorite. Uh, you, the, the normal tools and techniques that would work on softer stones like the alabaster and marble we'll cover uh, later are completely ineffective. Uh, they're completely ineffective against this sort of stone. It all has to wor be worked uh, with sort of punches perpendicularly against the stone and um, those, those tools wear out very much quick, more quickly. Even if you're using uh, power assisted tools, the, the process is much, much slower. Uh, so there's, there's a real awareness here and a desire to show the evidence of the difficulty of that working. Here's a short video from Stephen's uh, sculpture yard, and we're looking at a piece that is a similar size and shape to Peregrine Sentinel. And you can see here how he has marked up some of the forms on the stone, uh, with the intent of uh, carving in and creating a finished sculpture. Here's Stephen with one of his larger and earlier pieces uh, in Imperial Porphyry. This is a work called Dreadnought, and uh, it's a piece in which he's been uh, exploring the Imperial Porphyry and sort of its condition, and uh, the things that have happened to it over its history. The pits and hollows that you see in this work 
are from uh, pieces of tuff that he gouged out uh, and dug out of this enormous uh, piece of imperial porphyry. It also had a split down the middle, um, and that was uh, then gilded by Stephen. You can see that gold shining in the sun. And then if you notice, there are a bunch of sort of parallel uh, stripes on the face of this piece, and those are uh, tool marks from the Roman quarrymen who were originally sort of roughing out this piece. It was uh, ultimately abandoned in the quarry uh, until Stephen brought it back to, uh, to Britain and worked with it. Now I'm showing you a closer view of Dreadnought, and you can see that line of gold there to call you atten your attention to that split in the porphyry, and that may well be why the Romans abandoned it in the quarry. Also, all of those large inclusions of tuff might have made this a less desirable uh, piece of stone for the Roman masons. Uh, but you can see their initial... Uh, marks from uh, drills that they use to kind of cut down in and uh, use to split the stone. And we'll see uh, some wedge marks on the other side in just a moment. Here on the back side of Dreadnought, you can see some of those tuff inclusions that haven't been removed by Stephen. They look like uh, big chunks of marshmallow in a jello salad, for example, and uh, more of those sort of drill marks from the Romans. There are a few sort of square uh, cut marks, too, that are evidence of uh, wedges that would have been driven in as part of the stone splitting process. Um, and what I think is so interesting about uh, Stephen Cox and his work is that, for one thing, he's one of the only sculptors currently working in these hard stones today. Um, his assistant Tim is following in his footsteps in a way, using basalt and deliberately working with hard stones. But these are materials that in many ways are, are materials of the past, not of the present. And in Stephen Cox's work, we see a dialogue between a present-day sculptor and these very ancient, uh, important materials. Uh, he has tremendous respect for them, and the work that he does represents a sort of conversation that he has with these materials. And when you examine his work and really look at it, and we'll see some more work when we get to Alabaster, you really get a sense, a better sense of those materials, thanks to Stephen's intervention as a sculptor.